much do you make from your YouTube content? Do you pay Alfred for his time? Did you and Allison almost get divorced? Why do you not look like yourself? Today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is definitely not going to be an easy video to make. What was the hardest aspect of sharing your eating disorder publicly? I think the hardest part about talking about my binge eating disorder publicly has been, I don't know, just confronting a lot of the, the shame that sits with just even acknowledging that you have something like that. For so many years, it was like this deep, dark secret I was hiding. And so even though I like intellectually know there shouldn't be shame, I still feel feel some of the, the baggage of that shame. But I will also say it has not been nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be when I played this scenario out in my head about talking about it publicly. And people have been incredibly supportive and kind about the whole thing. And I gotta say, I'm, I'm super appreciative of that and very much overwhelmed by some of that experience. So thank you for all the folks who have sent me very kind notes and comments over the last six months or so as I've talked about this stuff. What's your opinion on the semi-glutide shots like Ozempa? I honestly don't feel like I'm a person who knows enough to really be qualified to give some very good in-depth answers on that question. What I will say is that if it's helping people, I see it as a positive, but at the same time, it's still such a new thing and I don't know if it's been truly tested and researched and I don't know if there's some sort of, you know, monkey paws like consequence that sits behind it all. And so obviously talk to doctors, but I actually think the more interesting thing about the dialogue around things like Ozempic and semaglutides or however you say it, there seems to be this interesting thing with society where, you know, folks will get fat shamed and it's like seen as like this moral failing where it's like, hey, if you're overweight, you need to go do something about it. Meanwhile, at the very same time, when somebody uses something like a drug to lose weight, there's like a lot of judgment and criticism, like, hey, you did it the cheating way and that's not the way you're supposed to lose weight, which I feel is kind of like hypocritical. Are you taking medicine to help you lose so much weight? No, I have never actually taken any medication for weight loss whatsoever. My weight loss has just been a combination of confronting my binge eating disorder, which happened primarily through therapy and lots of other tools like journaling and that sort of thing, as well as focusing on healthy eating habits and a really good farm derived diet, exercising regularly in the winter months or just working around the farm and being insanely active during the summer months. That quite honestly is at the root of how, you know, I've lost I don't know, it's about 90, 95 pounds over the last year. And really over the last five or six months, I've been just very focused on maintaining my weight and like keeping in good habits and not letting my eating disorder turn toxic maybe in another direction. When people comment on how good you look, why don't you just take the damn compliment? While I fully recognize that a lot of the folks who do make nice comments about my appearance are coming from a very good place and very good intention, there are a couple of very specific reasons why I really try not to focus on folks' compliments about my appearance or my weight loss. Like number one, I've said I'm dealing with an eating disorder and emotional emotional eating and body dysmorphia and lots of things like that. And so when you like take those comments from folks and internalize them and say, oh, well, thank you, I appreciate it. I genuinely believe you're actually doing something that could be doing more harm than good for you mentally because you also then have to think of the flip side. Am I a better person because I lost 90 pounds? No, I don't really think so. Was I a worse person when I was 90 pounds heavier? I also don't think that that's the case. And I know there are a lot of folks who are saying, no, I'm just trying to be nice and take a compliment. I know folks are usually coming from a very good place when they make comments about my weight and you know compliment me about, hey, you look great. I will continue to ignore those and not quote unquote take the compliment. To what extent do your more liberal, city slicker views clash with your born and raised country friends views? I've noticed that of the homesteaders I follow, you're the most socialist slash city minded. Good morning, dogs. Good to see you. Good to see you. So I don't know if my views necessarily clash with a lot of my neighbors. I mean, there's definitely more folks who might have a more conservative viewpoint than me, but I feel like as far as rural places go, this is one of the more left-leaning rural places you can find in the United States. I don't find it clashes all that much. Did you research Vermont's hunting laws pertaining to private property before you bought your farm? Well, I knew that Vermont would allow landowners to hunt without getting a hunting license, which is actually how I end up hunting here on our land. I also learned that, yes, Vermont 
Vermont has sort of a constitutionally protected right to hunt. And in order to exclude folks from your land, you needed to post your land. I was aware of all of those things, but I don't think I was quite ready for the depth in which those rules need to be applied and followed for them to take effect. For example, I didn't know that you had to update your signs every single year. And even if you look at the Fish and Wildlife website of a posted sign, that doesn't even have a place to put a date. And it only has one very tiny reference to the fact that you do need to update your signs annually. So that was a learning for me. And then the other thing is like the hound hunting thing and the fact that like hounds can go on posted land. And prior to the stink that I made about the whole thing about two years ago, I challenge anybody to find examples of that being easily and readily available to landowners to know. Which actually comes to a bigger thing that I feel like is behind this question. People will often say, well, you should have researched it and you should have looked it up and you should have known that before you bought land. But there's always going to be things that people miss when they're doing their due diligence process. The idea that there's one specific detail that you might miss and then say two or three years later have a regret, not about the whole activity, but like one very specific thing. I don't think it's crazy to think that people might be dealing with something like that. If you could, would you change anything about how you handled the hunters on your property and all the drama after? The one thing that I would probably done differently is I probably would not have rushed out as quickly as I did to start the petition. And I probably would have done more research. That said, after doing the research, I probably still would have done something like the petition. So I don't know. The answer is probably not. I think my biggest regret is just how frosty the relations between between say fish and wildlife and our farm have gotten, that is actually maybe the more frustrating thing. Have you ever felt unsafe due to the actions of hound hunters in your community? Oh yes, I have definitely felt unsafe. I mean, just watch this video over here and you'll get a sense of it. When will you accept that hunting dogs can randomly go on your farm property? I doubt I ever will, and I'll continue to advocate on this one. Do you regret your emotional responses to crisis moments? I fully acknowledge that I am a passionate person, and when I feel passionate about something, I get fired up about it. And that way that I get fired up will happen if you talk to me and meet me in person, and it will also happen when I'm making these videos. I know for a fact that that can often rub people the wrong way, and people feel like I'm might be courting drama. But the reality is that's just me being my authentic self. That said, I would be a real schmuck if I didn't acknowledge that that passion and that way of approaching things, particularly as I put videos out into the public, has most certainly created problems for myself as well as for others. And so yes, I have actually tried to curtail that a little bit in recent years. Um, I don't know if you guys can notice or not. I think it probably hit a little bit of a peak uh, in 2022 with all the breeder drama. But as I can continue to work on myself and my own mental health and my own approach to the world. I think actually if I look at the last year, I've mellowed out significantly in how I approach a lot of those things. Why do you cry on camera? I cry on camera for two reasons. Number one, in the moments that I am crying, that's how I feel and it's just my genuine reaction to things. When I was first dealing with the disappearance of Molly murder mittens, I was heartbroken and I genuinely couldn't even talk about her or the situation without choking up. I don't feel like I'm creating authentic and honest content if I just turn that off and say, no, 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 I don't want to do that because people are going to think I'm pandering. And then reason number two why I cry on camera is because I think it's important for us to normalize men crying in public. I hope there's boys who are watching my videos and seeing that and saying, oh, that's an okay way to be a guy. When did you discover that you had ADHD and how did you react to that fact and cope? As I look back on my entire childhood and teenage years, all the signs of ADHD were always clearly there. Highly disorganized, constantly getting distracted. I couldn't remember to do assignments or take notes or do like a lot of those kind of focused tasks that are uninteresting to kids but are really important. But then at the same time, I could sit in my room for nine hours on a summer day and draw an entire comic book and be completely content and focused and happy. So the signs of me being a person whose brain operated different from the norm were always there. And then by the time I became an adult and I was like living on my own in my early 20s, I finally decided to like actually go see a doctor and get some things checked out. Yeah, I was pretty quickly diagnosed as having adult ADHD. I have worked on like behavioral therapy type stuff. And even today I take medication to help with my ADHD. I'll admit that I struggle with that 
decision. And I wouldn't necessarily say that ADHD is a strength, but it's just a part of who I am. Yes, there are some definite downsides to it, but a lot of that hyper-focus that's kind of the other side of that coin has also let me do some really great things, and I'm grateful for it in that regard. I wanted to ask how you are doing mentally. I mean, a lot is happening right now, and I hope you are not too stressed and so on. Well, I appreciate you asking that question. You know, uh, I'm actually doing pretty good right now. I had kind of a, call it a darker September. You know, it was this combination of sort of being the tail end of the summer farming season and just sort of burnt out, plus the fact that when Molly Murdered Mittens disappeared, that one really honestly hit me hard. And, uh, oh, hey, Ginny. <laughs> Perfect timing. I'm talking about your mom. But, uh, no, I feel like at this point through October and into November, bounce back and feeling pretty good about things. I'm excited for some of my winter projects. I've already started writing a new book, having a lot of fun just hanging out with some friends lately and spending a lot of more quality time with Allison. In fact, I was just talking to my therapist about that earlier this week, which is also a great segue to today's video sponsor, BetterHelp. As you've even heard in this video, right, I am somebody who actually regularly sees a therapist, but I'm also somebody who lives out in the middle of nowhere. And so getting to an actual therapist's office and trying to meet with them, say, once a week or every other week, it's very, very difficult for me. And even then, if I look in my local area, those options are rather limited. BetterHelp is an online platform that offers you access to thousands of therapists across the United States with all sorts of specialties, and you get so many options and so much flexibility, and you can meet with them over the phone, you can meet with them over video, you can have like a texting relationship. There's so many different ways that you can do it. And I have personally used BetterHelp over the years to find access to therapists myself. To get started, you just fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and then you'll get matched with therapists in most cases within 48 hours or less. And you can schedule therapy sessions at a time convenient to you, and you don't have to leave your home to meet. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash Goldshaw Farm. Clicking that link helps support our farm, but it also will give you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. How do you choose the names for your animals? So it's not a really scientific process for how we choose the names of animals here on our farm. You know, some of the animal types have specific rules like the cattle, and sometimes like our dogs, we want to give them fancy names and all the barn cats names end with barn cat. But other than that, it's pretty much just what Allison and I want to name them is what we end up naming them. Morning, everybody. How are my chickens this morning? Are you gals getting used to your new home yet? Given the risks of horned Highland cattle, have you ever considered getting polled Highland cattle instead? So in terms of the horned cattle, I would never, ever, ever try to disbud or dehorn my Highland cattle. That's a genetic trait that's very specific to the breed. And number one, it would harm an animal to remove like an adult horn. Like that, that would be the worst thing you could do. But I think if you were to like like, you know, burn the horn nubbins off of a young calf, it would actually have some real damaging effects. Number one, it's painful and stressful. Number two, it would actually mean that that animal would struggle in a herd with other cattle that have horns. Number three, my cattle actually use their horns for a lot of specific activities, whether it's accessing food, scaring away coyotes, or even just communicating with each other. The horns of the Scottish Highland cattle were something I was most scared about when I first brought them onto the farm. But I've since learned that they're not gonna just like aggressively try to gore you. I actually think like a trampling risk is a significantly greater risk than being stabbed by a horn. Are your animals vaccinated? Some of the animals are vaccinated, like the dogs and cats all get regular vaccinations. The cattle get regular vaccinations. Like if I'm bringing new birds onto the farm, they get vaccinated, but if they're born here, I don't get them vaccinated. It's not to say that I'm against it. It's just a matter of practicality as I've talked about some of our vet challenges in the past. But that's not to say that I'm opposed to it in any way, shape or form. Is Joey Ramon going to the freezer this winter? No, Joey Ramon is not going to the freezer this winter. We actually have him on the schedule for September, 2024. Is Justin Finch Fletchley still around? So yes, my old arch nemesis, Justin Finch Fletchley is no longer on the farm. He actually ended up going into the freezer. That was a combination of both wanting to diversify my gene pool as well as the fact that I was concerned that his breed of goose, which was the pilgrim, might be the carrier of the angel wing problem I was dealing with in my flock. And so, yes, he was retired. And in case you're wondering, I'm in the process of integrating all of the birds into their winter house. So that's what's going on right now. Why do you become so attached to your animals knowing that they're going to be butchered? I believe it's important to show all the animals and critters on our farm love, regardless if they're breeding stock 
or a pet or an animal that's ultimately being raised for me. I would actually grow concerned about myself as the farmer if I didn't show those expressions of love and care to animals that I was ultimately going to butcher. Do your heifers get neglected? Bonnie and Belinda are rarely in vids. I think the reason you don't see Bonnie and Belinda nearly in as many videos is I have so much ground to cover and so many animals to take care of these days, it's usually hard to cram that all into one specific video. When will we get the story of why your white highland cow and her calf never arrived at your farm? No, I'm not going to ever really get into the story of why the white cow and her calf aren't coming to the farm. And you know, this one actually comes back to something I said earlier around how I've tried to grow and how I've tried to think about the impact my videos can have on the broader world and balancing just trying to make these raw expressions of my personal feelings with that. And so quite frankly, I'm doing my best to try to act responsibly and that's why you're never gonna hear that story. Why don't you make your own hay? You had so much grass this year, you would have saved a large chunk of money. I get that question a lot from folks, but I feel like the people who are asking that question <laughs> are not actually considering the full economics and costs associated with producing hay. They see the grass and they just assume, oh, you have grass, so you must be able to just produce that hay. But I've actually done the math in the business case for whether to buy or produce my own hay. When I take into account the cost of the equipment I need to purchase, and I take into account the cost of time that it would take to actually hay the fields, and then when I consider the fact that I would then need to manure those same fields, like all of those costs add up. So that's not to say that I will never ever make my own hay, but at least at this stage of the game where I'm at right now and where my farm's at right now, I would actually lose money by making hay versus buying the hay. Are you ever going to stack your hay bales correctly, young man? So when I was taking my hay delivery this year, I genuinely tried to stack my hay the best I could and do it in a very neat and orderly fashion. Unfortunately, sometimes the tasks that I have to do will outstrip my skills with the tractor. And all the hay bales, when I started to put the second layer on, started to topple over each other. I think one distinction to make, though, is that some folks think that I should be stacking the bales on their side, but when you have wrapped fermenting round bales like that, that's not what folks particularly who are guiding me around here in this area recommend. And so that is why I do them where it's like upright versus on their sides. Black Francis, are you trying to hook up with that duck? Why don't you process your beef more regularly? So when it comes to cattle and my cattle operation, that is a sort of more longer term play. The cash flows from raising cattle don't happen to you immediately. They take time for payout. For example, when I think of the cost of inputs with the cattle, whether it's buying livestock or buying hay, or even some of the equipment that I use to manage the cattle. And then when I think about the things that drive return on those costs, like when I have new calves being born on the farm, or I'm harvesting one of my steers for beef, those things take either a longer time to pay off or they're assets that remain on my balance sheet. For example, to give you just some rough math on some things, it's gonna cost me about $2,900 for hay over the course of this winter for all of my cattle. But at the same time this year, I produce one calf and I'm hopeful that all five of my cows are pregnant right now. And so next year that will produce five calves, but you know, call it like say $1,500. If I'm having a couple of calves each year, that's paying for the cattle. And then if I look at what I would actually make if I net out the cost of raising a steer from birth to harvest, I think once I remove the cost of hay and I remove the cost of livestock and I remove the cost of like veterinary care and animal management infrastructure, it's like a net profit of like $1,000 per steer. And so as you start to get scale and have a larger herd, that becomes the economic payback. And so all of this is my long-winded way of saying that no, the cattle are not profitable just yet, but I'm gonna see a return on those assets probably two or three years out. Which is why being diversified and having businesses like say trees or geese are important for the farm because those things have a cash flow that pays off on an annual cycle. Do you pay Alfred for his time? I get the vibe sometimes that he just does all he does to help out, but that seems kinda exploitative. You know, when I put the call out for questions, you guys didn't disappoint because I think between all the social media platforms, there were like more than 600 questions. This one popped up a number of times where folks think I don't actually pay my buddy Alfred for the work that he does on the farm. The truth of the matter is when he's doing actual like projects here on the farm, like building the wall or when he helped me build the greenhouse or he helped me dig the pond, like any of those projects, I am paying him for his time. Like that would not feel right to me even remotely. Yes, there are occasionally things where he's just like helping me out as a friend, just like there's things where I help him out as a friend, like 
like that's totally normal. But like if it's real work and it's taking him away from like other jobs that he could be doing, I'm absolutely paying him a fair wage. Would you be profitable without YouTube? Yes, for the last several years, even without YouTube money or any other social media money, our farm is profitable. It's not like crazy profitable. It would just put me just barely over like the poverty line in terms of wages earned, but it is profitable. Like our ultimate profits from the farm operations last year were like $18,000 and change. This year, I don't have a final number. I think it might actually end up being just a little bit less, but it remains profit. That is the expenses of running the farm and taking care of all the animals and doing all the stuff that I do there are subtracted from all the revenue that it generates when I sell something like a goose or a tree or a pound of beef or even a bar of soap. And so yes, the farm is absolutely profitable even without the social media money. I I, th I think the one thing that people could actually fairly push back on is I do use that social media to market my farm products. And so absent that, would I be able to sell as much as I do and charge the prices that I do? I think that that's a very difficult hypothetical question to answer because I've built my distribution strategy around that part of my business. So if I wasn't doing that, I would do something else, but that might make the shape and look of my business look different. And so it's it's a very difficult what if to, to play out. Do you remember when you suggested crypto for your farm? Thoughts? Now let's be fair, I never once suggested that I was gonna offer cryptocurrency from the farm. But back in early 22, I absolutely did make a video exploring the idea of NFTs and potentially using NFTs as a way to drive capital and investment into small farms. And that is definitely an idea that's aged as well as a two-year-old duck egg. But I don't even remotely regret exploring that idea and considering that idea. The only problem is it seems like NFTs have turned out to be a terrible idea. And so I'm really glad I listened to all of you guys when I threw the idea out there and say, hey, this is something I'm looking at. What do you think? And pretty much everybody said, we hate it. How much capital? Have you invested in starting your farm overall? I did a video on this topic a couple of years ago, and I think the number that I came up to was $450,000. Hey, look, there's Ralph the Duck. He's hanging out with all of his other duck friends. With the cost of the construction of our new barn, that's definitely over the half million dollar mark at this point. But I think it's also a little bit tricky when you look at just that one big number, right? Because that includes our house, which is our home. And so we don't have to pay for housing. It includes all the land and the real estate assets equipped with it. And even when I look at a project like building the barn, that improves the value of the farm itself. And so you could almost argue it's a bit of an investment. And there are certain things like the purchase of our tractor that I probably wouldn't have done if I didn't have the income from social media. So I guess this is just a long-winded way of saying that it's kind of a complicated answer to try to give you guys. But if I was going to give you guys a number off the top of my head, it's probably 600 and something thousand dollars that we've probably invested into the farm over the past seven years. And if you guys want to know how to make a small fortune farming, just start with a medium-sized fortune. Did you use an inheritance to help you buy your acreage? The answer to that one is zero, zilch, zippo, nothing. There is no trust fund, there is no massive inheritance. I actually haven't really inherited much of anything other than uh, when I graduated college when I was 22, I had like tens of thousands of dollars in student debt. I got a job and worked and really didn't even make much headway in paying that debt off until I really kind of switched to, to working in the corporate world full time when I was in my mid 20s. I had the really good fortune of just working good, decent paying jobs and being a good saver and socking away my money. So then by the time I was 36 and I bought this farm, we paid for it all in cash. The final purchase price was like $350,000 and none of that money whatsoever was any sort of inheritance dollars. Do you ever doubt yourself as a true farmer considering a majority of your revenue is from the content creator side? You know, over the years, I've made a number of videos talking about the sense of imposter syndrome I feel when it comes to being seen as a farmer and being known as a farmer. But I will say, particularly over the course of this farming season and this summer, I've, I've kind of stopped caring about it a lot more. Friends of mine who are farmers have actually framed it for me in a very interesting way, where if you look at 90% of the farms in the United States, they're generating most of their income from off-farm activities. And if you look at the USDA definition and threshold of $1,000 derived from the farm, we easily clear that hurdle, no doubt. And I'm definitely out here working on the farm every single day doing 
95% of all the farm activities and chores. Like the only actual farm employees we have are myself and the dogs and the cats. I hire various tradespeople like Alfred or electricians or plumbers or folks like that to help me do specialty tasks around the farm. You know, the kind of stuff that I completely lack the aptitude for. And yes, I do know that there are traditional farmers out there and folks in social media and like homesteading reddits and that sort of thing who will get upset because I'm able to earn money from videos about the farm versus just the farm itself. But if you look at most modern farms right now to begin with, either they're these gigantic agri corporations or they're small diversified farms that often have things like farm stays or goat yoga or pick your own pumpkin patches and that sort of thing. And in my opinion, those sorts of activities of agro-tourism are not even remotely different than making videos and putting them on social media. They're essentially farm adjacent activities that help keep the farm afloat. Do you ever plan on having the general public visit your farm or have an Aidman type of thing in your farm? Now, occasionally I will auction off a tour of the farm for special charities because I feel like that's an important thing to do. And if you ever buy a goose from us, you come to the farm to pick it up. And when you come to the farm to pick it up, you actually get the benefit of a mini tour of the farm. And I do dream of one day trying to set this up where I have like open farm days and so it wouldn't be like every day or every weekend but like maybe uh, like three or four Saturdays over the course of a year there's like these days where you can come to the farm and I'll do maybe like a little talk or two and show you some things about the farm and like that could be a way for folks to visit. And so that might be something I do one day in the future, but I will never, ever, ever do like on-farm stays or Airbnb. I started to realize that, gosh, then my job becomes basically a hotel owner and I have zero interest in being in the hospitality business. Can I come work for you for a weekend? Nope, I will never ever do like a, like a volunteer program for people to just come work for a day or a weekend and have farm therapy. That's for a few very important reasons. Number one, I see it as a potential liability where that person could do more harm than good. Number two, it actually becomes more of a distraction for me to have to manage and direct and teach that person versus the force multiplier of the work that that person's gonna create. And then number three, I actually feel like Farm work is work and people deserve to be paid for doing their work. And when you have things like volunteer programs and you have things like intern programs, you're not actually paying people fairly. And it just doesn't quite sit well with me. And so I don't think I will ever do something like that. Why didn't you spend the money to just renovate the old barn? Why did you build the new barn instead? I'm confused. The reason I didn't upgrade this barn and instead chose to build this barn, I actually priced it out and explored you know, doing kind of a renovation of the big barn. And to do that, as well as do certain things to stabilize and improve the barn, it was actually gonna cost me about $100,000 more to work on the big barn versus just start fresh and build this barn. Now the old barn is gonna continue to be used for storage and animals, but the new barn is gonna be the workshop and the space for the tractor and vehicles in the winter and like kind of all of that stuff plus the second floor is gonna have the hatching activity. And with the old barn, I will continue to make investments to maintain it and keep it the way it is, but I don't expect to like invest a lot of money in trying to improve it and turn it into something that it's not going to be or not ever intended to be. The new barn looks beautiful, but why is the floor gravel? Now, the other big question I get with the barn is, why did I go with the gravel floor instead of pouring cement? Why do I have it sitting on piers instead of pouring a foundation and frost walls? And that was another cost savings choice as well. In order to pour a concrete foundation for this barn, it was gonna blow my price up for the project by like 20% or so. And given how I plan to use the space, it didn't necessarily make sense. Because of the depth of our frost line, it was gonna require a whole heck of a lot of concrete to pour the foundation for this building. And so that's what that cost is really rooted in. Versus the construction on the concrete piers that are set about six feet down into the ground, and then you have the entire building bracketed and resting on those piers. It just, it's a much cheaper way to build a structure like this. And since I did want to invest in an authentic timber framed wooden building versus doing something cheaper on the whole, one of the sacrifices I made was going with the gravel floor. And to be quite honest too, I'm not 100% locked onto it. If I ever wanted to like pour like a concrete pad or two inside there, 
I always can, you know, just build the forms and pour some basic level of concrete. Yeah, it might eventually crack, but it's not like a crack in the foundation, so it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But so far, I actually kind of like the gravel floor, and I'm going to stick with it and see how it goes. Do you have any plans to keep that beautiful new bond neat and organized? Slowly but surely, I am organizing this space and making it something where, like, everything that I have each has its place. And I'm going very slowly in doing that process so that I do it the right way. Basically, the system I have is a lot of the quick access tools and things I use on a regular basis are all out in the open. And then things that I use less frequently are in labeled boxes. I don't know if it's totally gonna work, but definitely before the end of the year, my goal is to be completely moved in here and have everything organized. We're still finishing off some of the electrical, so I'm also trying to give the electricians some space to kind of keep doing their thing as they have the time to do it. Is Kurt Cobain's skull done yet? It is, and I know precisely where I want to mount it. What's your biggest regret with the farm? Overall, I'm really, really happy with how I've progressed with the farm and how I've gone. I know there's certain mistakes I've made, but even those mistakes were really good lessons for me in terms of things to do or not do in the future or to consider. I guess it's all part of the learning curve. I know some folks are gonna see me like and watch my videos from afar and kind of judge that and say, well, you should have known better or you should have done this or that. But no, look, I genuinely didn't know better. And I don't know, that's just part of the learning process, I guess, particularly for somebody like me. I think the biggest regret I have on the farm though is when I was planting the permaculture orchard, I regret putting in those swales and berms and I regret doing everything on contour. Meaning rather than doing everything in like a straight line, it's curved to match the elevation. While that does really follow good permaculture principles, it makes it so much harder to maintain. And I think the added water uh, and benefit of the swales and berms doesn't overcome the complicated maintenance and management that's required. And so if I had a do-over on any one farm project task, that would be it. I regret trying to rush into doing our home renovation. That's maybe a bigger one too. Um, I wish we like kind of just lived with things as they were and then tried to maybe make that investment. And I really did a whole podcast on this concept, but I also regret not trying to address my like kind of personal problem and using my dream of the farm as a way to be the object of the thing that's gonna make me happy. When in the reality, and I've just really come to know this now, if you're not happy with yourself, you're just not gonna be happy in general, regardless if you're living your dream life or not. What's the most uncomfortable farm life fact that you've had to explain to a child? Without a doubt, the hardest thing that I've had to explain to a kid about the farm was talking to my nephews about the disappearance of Molly murder mittens. Having that conversation with kids about death is never easy, but sort of a mysterious disappearance where you don't even have resolution and they might still have that sort of small chance of hope and you see them pinning a lot on that small chance of hope. That was a difficult conversation. I can't even imagine like sort of the challenges my, my sister and brother-in-law were having with talking about it with them because I, I barely got through that conversation without crying. Have you ever gotten an infection from all the bacteria around that farm of yours? So the other day I actually had to go to urgent care because I was getting uh, an infection in my finger that I cut uh, earlier this fall. But it wasn't really necessarily farm related. It's just a very difficult area for the skin to heal. And so that's kind of what I was struggling with there. But I've had friends who've gotten like crazy sick from things like uh, they got splashed with chicken guts when butchering chickens and they got sick from that. I've never had to deal with anything like that. I've been pretty lucky. I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to farm hygiene and that like as soon as I go into the house I immediately wash my hands. I try to like shower and change clothes too when I get into the house and so that I'm not wearing kind of the gross dirty farm clothes inside the house. It's probably more of an Allison rule than a Morgan rule, but it is what it is. What would you do if you get injured and can no longer run the farm? I think there's a real distinction between short-term and long-term disability. If it was a short-term disability and injury or illness, like it would put me out of commission for you know a couple of weeks or months, I would probably be relying on a combination of my wife, my friends, and hired help, like I would hire folks to actually just work on the farm. And so that's not necessarily a great answer to what my backup plan is, but that's what I would do in the short term. 
If it was a longer term thing, like I suddenly became paralyzed and I could no longer walk or something, I don't know what I would do. Do you think farming will ever get too old to you? I feel like there's two different ways to interpret this question. Like, will the farm just get boring and it's like old and passe for me? I hope that's not the case. I find that as I keep taking on new challenges and keep evolving the farm, that in and of itself keeps things interesting and fresh for me. If the question is about what happens when I become too old to farm this land and do this? You know, my goal really is to keep doing this as long as I physically possibly can and then when I can't, I would just stop. Where do you get your water? So even when it comes to our farm water that's all the way up here, it comes from our well which is all the way down by the house. It goes from the well into the house, then out to the pump that's over by the brooder shed, and then I have like tubes that run all the way up here. Eventually there is that spring that I want to try to tap and run that down here and that would be a second source of water for the farm. But at this point that has officially become a next year project. Why do you always film the animals going to the bathroom? Baby B just actually dropped the baby dookie. Um, but I don't know, I think it's kind of funny when the edibles go to the bathroom and it's real and manure management and poop management is a big part of being a livestock farmer. When you're ever out in the back pasture and you have to go to the bathroom, do you go back into the house or do you just find a place behind a tree? I mean, in my opinion, if they can use the field as a bathroom, I see no reason why I can't either. If you had to start your farm over again, are there any changes that you would want to make? So I'm gonna to choose to interpret this question as if I had to leave this farm and start fresh in 2023, knowing what I know now, having the skills that I have now, like what would I end up doing? And the answer is the farm would actually look very different than what I ended up doing here because the situation has changed significantly too. When we bought this farm in 2016, a remote farm in the middle of nowhere could be acquired relatively cheaply. Here we are in 2023 and I do not think that that is actually the case. In fact, at this point, I think you would be paying a premium for good high quality farmland like the ones we have right now. And so if I had to start over, I would probably buy large acres of woodlands and I would focus my farm operations on raising pigs, goats, and chickens and convert that woodland into silvopasture. Which I know for longtime viewers of our YouTube channel must sound kind of funny because I've been so adamant about never raising goats and I haven't exactly loved raising pigs. But that very specifically relates to our context here on this farm and how we do things today. Different contexts will require a different game plan. Asking in the most respectful way, but the farm is looking kind of junky. Will you do a farm tidy up someday? I guess, yeah, it does kind of look junky. I mean, looking at it from up here, it looks very pretty to me, but yeah, I do leave stuff lying around too much. And we have like, you know, big white plastic round bales of hay that probably don't fit the image of a regenerative farm. It's an uphill battle. It's not in my nature. And it is definitely a bit of a struggle. Come on, get your grass. Come on, girls. Name some YouTubers and homesteading channels you stay away from. What do you really think about the homesteading community? I think you guys are trying to get me in trouble with that question, so I'm gonna be careful in how I answer it. I have answered that actually in the past before and it's created problems. Yes, I think there's actually some tremendous folks in the homesteading community and tremendous content creators in the homesteading community. And so I've got lots of friends in that area. Even as I have personally pulled back from that space for some very specific reasons, which probably requires a video into itself. But if I'm going to name names, I guess my two least favorite content creators remain to be those two extreme right wing guys. One of them's a fake Amish guy and the other guy's a fake lumberjack. How do you deal with and fight against the othering that is so prevalent in the homesteading community with respect to religion. This is also a topic that I've spoken a lot about in the past, and yeah, I think it's a massive problem, and the last time I made a video about this, I got a lot of flack for it, and I think the situation's only gotten worse since I made that video last year. I, frankly, as I kind of alluded to just a moment ago, I'm just kind of moving away from it, and, and like I said, that's a whole video I should probably make unto itself but it's a massive problem. I don't think that for folks who fall out of the kind of normal archetype for a US homesteader kind of person, um, it can be difficult and it's not a very inclusive community. Even if they might make overtures to it, I think there's a lot of behaviors 
that make a lot of folks feel othered and or excluded, and I would definitely put myself in that category. Do you think that homesteading in the United States is an entirely white thing? I mean, it's not like completely white, but pretty much. And I think the, the previous question and answer I just gave um, has everything to do with it, for sure. How do you stand with our Lord Jesus? So no shade intended to folks who do, but I for one do not. What is your cultural background? So my mother's mother was an immigrant from Ireland and my mother's father was an immigrant from Italy. On my dad's side of the family, they're all, you know, Eastern European Jewish folk. And so I'm just a pure American mutt. Hey, Morgan. Uh, first time, long time, big fan of the show. Really love the cats. I was wondering if you've ever watched the American version of The Office. If not, do you get some type of sadistic, perverse, satisfaction out of the awkward silence that ensues a reference to the office in a daily conversation love the show very funny there buddy when it first hit america i absolutely was like the world's biggest fan of the british office i loved ricky gervais and his portrayal i loved how all the characters were i thought that that show was brilliant and so when they made the American spinoff, I refused to watch it on principle. And I don't even know if it was necessarily founded on any good principle. So yeah, here I am decades later, a guy who has never ever seen a full version of the American office. And that often makes the situation very socially awkward for my friends. What size shoe do you wear? Usually in US shoe sizes, I'm like an 11, sometimes like an 11 wide. Front to back or back to front? Do you use a B-Day? Knowing what you know now, would you still vote for Biden? I mean, look, he is not the guy I would pick to vote for, but he definitely seems like the best available option as things are starting to shape up for the uh, 2024 election. But yeah, definitely not the guy I would objectively choose, but I don't know, there's a lot of worse options out there. Why did you platform Taylor Lawrence? You know, of all of the podcast episodes I've done, there has been none that has received more criticism than the one where I interviewed Taylor Lorenz. You know, she's a technology reporter with the Washington Post. She wrote this incredible book this year uh, called Extremely Online, where she breaks down the history of you know, social media influencers and kind of the rise of that business. And I really enjoyed the conversation I had with her. I think a lot of folks struggle with Taylor and, and are critical of her, I think for a couple of reasons. I think, yeah, sexism does come into play in a number of instances. I think number two, the fact that she actually tries to be kind of real and authentic in social media platforms, I think rubs folks the wrong way. And then really number three, it comes down to the fact that she is a journalist doing a journalist's job and asking questions and digging into things and investigating. That's literally what journalists are supposed to do. And when people see something uncovered that they don't like or is critical of something that they like based on that journalism, I don't know, it's become the norm to attack the journalism themselves or the journalists themselves versus actually unpack the situation that's at play there. So I don't know. I would happily have her on a video again, and I enjoy talking to her, so I don't know. I disagree with the question asker there. Do you support LGBTQ? Unquestionably 100%. I actually think I should be going out of my way even more to support folks, not even a second's hesitation on that one. Would you rather be sticky or sweaty for the rest of your life? This one's a tough one for me because, uh, Pretty much throughout the entire summer, I am sweaty. Like almost at all times, I am sweaty. And so um, I feel like I already experienced this. And I don't know, it's not great to be always sweaty, but uh, I would prefer to be always sweaty versus always sticky. What does Johnny Wanzer smell like? I don't know, what does the three needs in Burlington smell like? Uh, it's pretty much a combination of that and the prepared food section of a Cumberland Farms. Hey Morgan, big fan. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how much money would it take to uh, kiss Butch on the mouth? Also, uh, Team Ralphie, we stand him. Have you ever had a moment where you've debated giving up and going back to a steady paycheck? No, not even remotely. In fact, that's like my nightmare at this point. I love the way I earn a living. I love the fact that I can focus all of my time here on the farm and making videos and writing books. Like, the fact that that is now my life, I feel like one of the luckiest human beings alive and am eternally grateful, frankly, to all of you guys who've supported me that actually enables me to be able to do that. Now that you are living your retirement dreams, do you have new retirement dreams or other lifetime goals? 
dreams. Now, honestly, it's something I struggle with a little bit. I mean, as far as retirement dreams, no, I just kind of want to keep doing this. Did you and Allison almost get divorced from the changes that happened when moving from city life to rural life? You know, I've made the comment in the past where I said, oh, I probably would have ended up divorced if I hadn't made this change or that change. Um, it's not like we were ever on the verge of divorce, but there have been times in our marriage where we could both see it sort of trending towards a not good place, and that's been the thing that's made us both stop and say, hey, wait a minute, we gotta work on something, or me having to say, hey, I need to work on myself. That's what's driven it, but there's never like, we were on the brink and now we're saved. Like, it was never like that, and so I don't wanna overplay it, but um, I think, you know, being conscious of the health of your marriage and where are things, and course correcting as needed, that's like an important skill that you have to have to be a successful married couple. Have you and Allison felt the pressure to uphold a happy, healthy, and loving image of your relationship? Well, Allison and I definitely have a rule that like, we never try to force each other to perform on camera or like pretend to be happy or pretend to be in a better mood. Like if Allison's not in a good mood, I'm just not even gonna remotely try to get her into a video. And so that actually takes that pressure off. What other animal costumes does Allison want to wear. Well, rather than wear the bear costumes, we almost ended up ordering dinosaur costumes because Allison absolutely loves dinosaurs. It's like her favorite uh, kind of thing to experience, like going to a museum and seeing dinosaurs or, you know, going to the planetarium and watching a movie about the dinosaurs. Like, she loves dinosaurs. Jurassic Park is one of her favorite movies, and so we almost ended up in dinosaur costumes. Was you and your wife's decision not to parent mate independently before you found each other? or a decision you came to as a couple. I think since when she was a child, Allison has adamantly not wanted children, and so that was a decision she made independently. For me personally, it was always something that I was kind of indifferent to and not like a hardcore, like, I need to be a dad, I need to, you know, have a legacy, I need to pass on my genetics, like, so kind of Allison's staunch, you know, disinterest in having children and my indifference really netted us out as a couple who decided not to have kids. Have you and Allison ever considered adopting? I will say that we will never like actively like go out to try to adopt a kid like, oh, let's go to an adoption agency and try to figure this out. I mean, I think that maybe the one exception I could see potentially if there was some sort of circumstance where fostering was something we really needed to or felt like we should do, um, I could maybe see that. That's a very, very slim chance of that, but that would be the only way something like that I could see possibly playing out. But, but overall, I do not see us adopting. Your marriage shows signs of being open to some degree. Is that true in all respect? <laughs> wow, that's a hardcore question. No, not even remotely, no openness whatsoever. Very, very closed situation over here. Are you guys furries? Also, no, just because shortly before Halloween that we dress up like bears does not mean anything even remotely like that. <laughs> even though that's a very funny question. <laughs> How was Allison's reaction to Abby being a house dog? I mean, Allison was kind of okay with it. She's very opposed to having a house dog, even though I might possibly one day want a house dog. Um, but yeah, Abby did really well. But the tr trouble is, Abby's a very large dog. And I mean, I think you get less of a sense of it when you see her on videos and around the farm and side by side with Toby. But, you know, she's a hundred pound dog. And when she's like in our little crowded kitchen, you know, she can basically block the path so you can't like go around her. And because she's so affectionate and because she wants to just really please you, she will like almost Velcro to you sometimes. And so I think Allison was not a fan of like how Abby would like constantly be in the way. It's just a matter of Allison's not a huge fan of dogs. And so that's something that we try to balance based on my interest and love of dogs. Would you ever get a house dog? Like I said, maybe one day, uh, but no things or news to report on that one at all. Did Abby kill Dottie? No, Abby did not kill Dottie. But the truth of the matter is, there have been a couple of situations, particularly last year, where Abby would chase more chickens and particularly Dottie was consistently getting chased. And so I made the decision to rehome her before something bad did happen. And so Abby's behavior did motivate the removal of Dottie from the farm. Do you regret getting Lady Abington spayed? No, not even remotely. I, I think actually getting Abby spayed was the 100% right decision. 
and I'm glad we did it. I don't think she has the temperament or genetics that really would suggest she'd be a good candidate to pass on and, and to breed. And so, no, there would be no circumstance where I would see breeding her, even though I do love her. Whatever happened with the drama with Abby's breeder? Oh, no comment on that one. <laughs> I will just pass and keep going. If you knew then what you know now, would you still have gotten Abby? The extensive training, the breeder conflict, umbilical hernia, etc. That is such a difficult question to answer. I think on paper, if like I were to be able to go back in time and know all of the things that you just listed there, no, I probably wouldn't get Abby. But am I glad that Abby's here and do I love Abby? Um, yeah, and so I wouldn't want her to disappear now either. It's one of those things where you can't put toothpaste back in a tube. Sometimes playing scenarios out like that is like almost impossible to truly do because yeah, I wouldn't want to just send Abby away. I mean, I haven't sent Abby away. I do love that dog to death. Since breeding Abby didn't work out, do you plan to get a third Maremma or freeze Toby swimmers until you find a good match? I mean, maybe one day. I would say that all that drama, plus even some of the issues I've had with Toby's registration that have left me just like totally, totally frustrated with the whole process and not necessarily um, leaping at breeding dogs. The right opportunity came along for Toby to stud. I would 100% take it up. The problem is, number one, I'm not gonna be going out there and trying to harvest semen. Number two, I don't necessarily wanna send him away to somewhere. Um, if somebody wanted to leave their, you know, bitch with me for a little while, I would potentially think about doing something like that and, and I would love to take on one of those puppies, but I have no plans to find a, you know, third Maremma for breeding anytime soon. Does Toby try mating with Abby? No, actually, despite the fact that Toby is still fully intact, he does not try to mate with Abby. He does not try to mate with anybody. He doesn't try to hump anybody's legs. He's actually a very, very well-behaved dog. And uh, yeah, no, he has not tried to do anything even remotely like that. How is Toby doing with his illness? You know, I mentioned this actually in a podcast not too long ago, but uh, yeah, Toby's actually done really well with his recovery from, from Lyme disease, you know? He had some times where he just was definitely slower and it took recovery as he was on his medicine regimen. And even after that, he kind of lost a little bit of weight. Um, but at this point, he's now back up to about 100 pounds and, you know, kind of like completely back to normal. And it's really been good to see him bounce back like that. And so Toby Dog has is, is kind of made a full recovery. That said, I still try to monitor his levels and see if any sort of that lime is creeping back up. What's gonna happen when the dogs get older and they can't be guard dogs anymore? You know, we're still sort of working out the details of what retirement would look like for the dogs, but ideally it's just finding a way for them to be as comfortable and happy as possible here on our farm. Whether that means ending up in the house or having some sort of different shelter situation, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever those dogs need, I'm gonna work my butt off to adapt to and ensure that they have a happy life all the way un until the, to the very end. And I'm getting a little choked up with that question now. <laughs> um, Morgan, the kids wanna know if, if, can we just, can we have your dogs and then they can just come live here and join the pack? No, lady, you can't have my dogs and stop asking. It's getting a little bit weird. Has Lil Barncat tried to go outside since becoming an indoor house cat? Lil Barncat has only tried to escape the house once, and this was like in her first few months of being inside the house. Other than that, she actually spends most of her time up here in my office or if we have the fire going downstairs, she'll spend a lot of time down there. But she has been a model house cat, which is something we would have never expected. Right now, I'm actually in the process of writing my second book, which is, you know, got a working title of The Eight Lives of Lil Barn Cat. It's actually very nice to be up here and writing and have her just sort of purring away in her cat tree. I don't know, it's very good inspiration and motivation for writing. Do you regret not putting up a fence and protecting your cats from getting hurt or killed? So I have spent a lot of time investing investigating various fencing to keep cats like from wandering or roaming, whether it being like using a collar and like an invisible fence or like some sort of weird netting situation. And the reality is there's no fence we could put along the front of our property that would keep the cats from escaping. I could spend like $60,000 trying to build a fence in the front of our property to keep the cats from going. And they would just either go around it or go over it. Um, and, and so it's like, it just doesn't make any sense. The only way that works is if you like create a pen for them to stay in, and that's just not how barn cats work. So no, I don't feel responsible or guilty 
because it's not a viable solution. I know this will be a hard question for you to answer, but will you replace Molly Murder Mittens? <sighs> so I've actually thought long and hard about this one, and right now I think we're gonna stay as a two barn cat farm. I'm sorry, three barn cats, Lil, no offense, sweetie. In that, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get a new barn cat anytime soon. I know that one barn cat outdoors is not enough for us because we experienced that after Lil's injury and it was just Pablo outside. And I don't know, sometimes I felt like three might be too much because they would range further because there's more cats that require more territory. And so I'm wondering actually if two barn cats is like the happy medium. And right now Pablo and Ginny seem to be coexisting really, really well together. And so I don't want to mess up that chemistry and do anything. So yeah, no plans for any new barn cats anytime soon. Did you make a grave or shrine to Molly Murder Mittens? You know, I'm actually still thinking about a way to commemorate Molly. I think what I'm going to end up doing is actually getting a tattoo of Molly. And it might end up being something that I do where for every barn cat and probably even every uh, dog that we have, on the farm, I end up getting a tattoo to commemorate them. That to me actually feels like the best way to memorialize them. I just haven't quite decided on a design yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if I do that before the end of the year. How is Pablo? Is he still on a special diet food? Pablo has definitely recovered from the stones problem he was having, but I do have him still on that special uh, vet prescribed diet. And I actually give it to Ginny too, because it's very hard to segregate those two cats from eating and like what their diets are. And so yeah, they both actually get that specialty food and Lil gets to enjoy the regular old good stuff. Where does Pablo Barn cat poop? Anywhere he darn well wants to. What's the most annoying part about making videos for us? I genuinely don't think it's annoying. I actually feel like I'm very lucky and I have a lot of gratitude for the fact that I get to make videos for you guys. But I will say I am often disappointed when I work really, really hard on a certain video and like, nobody seems to want to watch it and like it's like very very low performing so for example when i made the video about like kind of looking into nigerian scammers and how all that works i i really worked really really hard on that video and was really hoping that you know people would find it interesting and i think the reality is nobody found that interesting and so i think that's disappointing when that happens um but you know that is what it is and people like what they like and I can't fault them for that. Why do you clickbait so much? I don't know, this question might be the second most annoying thing about making videos. I feel like people so don't understand what clickbait is, nor do they understand how YouTube specifically works. I see clickbait as something that is like bait and switch. Like, hey, I'm telling you it's gonna be this thing, but it's actually not. And, and like not paying off and delivering. Which I think is different than like misdirection, right? where if I make a video where I hint something and a lot of people like might immediately have an expectation of what that is or jump to an assumption about what that means, but then as the story unfolds in the video and there's some narrative twists and turns that like that idea is sort of almost like monkey pawed or subverted, that to me is not clickbait, even though a lot of folks do feel like that is. If the title does not like completely describe it like you're like, you know, I don't know, writing a caption for a photo, people get upset like, why is it not this thing? Like, why aren't you telling me exactly what's in this video? I don't want to, like I enjoy actually telling stories and having a little bit of element of surprise and some twists and turns in the story. Like, I think that's actually what makes for a good story. And so to just ruin that story with the title of the video is never, never something I wanna do. Having a strong title and having a strong thumbnail that brings people in is like half of actually doing good content on YouTube. So if you don't put that effort in into making an eye-catching thumbnail, if you don't put that effort in to, to like having a title that's gonna create some intrigue and make people wanna investigate and make them wanna click, then you're not gonna have people watch your videos. I think the flip side of that is the other really important way that like YouTube works is if people click on it and then immediately abandon that video, that video is not gonna be successful either. And so you gotta like pay off those expectations. And so that's something I'm always trying to do. I don't know if I 100% do it well, but I don't see anything of what I'm doing as clickbait. And so that, that's a big difference to me. To what factor does keeping your followers entertained impact your decision making? I don't ever want to fall into that trap where I'm like adding animals to my farm and I'm doing stuff on my farm solely for views and clicks. Like I just got an emu or, oh look, I just got, you know, a whole bunch of new dogs or, oh look, I'm doing this crazy, you know, stunt with my cat. Like I don't want it to fall into that trap, 
But at the same time, continuing to make videos and, and keep things interesting on the farm is, is important for like the success of the business of the farm. And so it's like a balancing act. I would be lying if I didn't say that that isn't something that I would stop and think about. But at the same time, I, I actually strongly oppose trying to make that a primary motivation. Hey, are you planning a collab with the Urban Rescue Ranch anytime soon? So we've been talking about doing this for a while and we just can't seem to kind of make our schedules to work where either I can end up in Texas or he can end up here. I don't know. It will happen one day. I, I can guarantee it. I just, I just don't know when. Morgan, I'm curious. What was the very last time you saw something in your raw footage from your filming that you would have been totally embarrassed or ashamed had it accidentally gone out and gone public? That wasn't good. I'm gonna have to get that cleaned up. Have you ever lied to us on your media platforms? In terms of lying in a form of fabrication, no. Other than like, for example, my April Fool's videos, which, you know, obviously are fabrications or uh, like the video where I pranked Alfred with the safe, even though by the end of that video, I come clean. I think there's details that I will sometimes leave out or leave in the background and not go into, but I think it's actually impossible to go and create content publicly and not do that sometimes whether you're trying to protect people in your lives or, you know, not do more harm with situations. And I mean, you know, I think I've even referenced a couple of those in this entire video. And so there'll be things where I'm like, I'm just not going to talk about that. And some people might say, well, you're not being honest if you're not talking about that. But the reality is if I can't at least have a certain measure of that barrier with some of the videos that I make and I can't make that choice for myself or people in my life, I don't think that that's sustainable. Like when I was dealing with initially treatment for my binge eating disorder. That was a significant thing in my life that I did not talk about at all in my videos. And even as people started to like physically notice some changes and comment on it, and I just sort of kept ignoring it, that was me, yeah, not being 100% like direct and honest in some ways, but that was for my personal mental health. Do you ever worry that your channel is dying? YouTube is like a cycle. I've been doing this now for more than five years where there's ups and there's downs. And sometimes you'll have hit videos and you'll be getting all, you know, thousands of new subscribers as quick as possible. And then other times, like right now, it's like actually, we got like solid views on a lot of videos, but it's like you're not driving in a lot of new folks. I guess you do get worried and you do get a little bit stressed, but I try not to let it bother me too much. And you know, continue again with that lottery philosophy. Like, okay, say money wasn't a real issue for me. What would I do? How would I live my life differently? And that's kind of just how I keep going. But at the same time, when you tie your self-esteem to your creative endeavors and what you're doing, um, it can sometimes be difficult. You gotta sort of balance it, but if I'm gonna be very honest with you guys, yeah, sometimes I worry about stuff like that. Why are your videos getting so boring? I've been with you since you started vlogging. Please see what's going wrong. I don't know, buddy. I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, I, I genuinely try to do my best to keep things interesting and keep things different. And, and I think it's actually a real struggle for me in that I think a lot of folks watch our videos for a lot of different reasons. Like I think some people like to watch it because they're really interested in just kind of weird quirky stories. I think some people like to watch it just because they want to experience farm life or they want to just watch and observe animals and they find it very soothing. I think a very, very tiny segment uh, think that some of my opinions are interesting, but I don't think most people watch because of my opinions. But that said, I try to vary up the formats of my videos and a lot of people get annoyed with that. I'm doing that to keep it interesting for me and hopefully keep it interesting for you guys. But I think for some people, like they only want you to do one thing and, and that becomes a struggle. And so I'm, I'm genuinely trying to keep it interesting and trying to not let it get boring. How come it seems like your content has gone from a daily vlogish style videos 2019 dashed 2021 to your more recent content where it seems less about the farm and more of yourself. And I think that that question asker is a perfect example of what I just described in the previous question, right? Like, okay, if you like just daily vlogs where it's just me doing farm chores, okay, that's one thing. But if I tell a bigger, broader story about, say, what's happening with, you know, vet care in the United States or 
um, my concerns about the U.S. healthcare system or something like that, like people get very upset by doing that. But again, I'm doing that to keep the content diversified and interesting and different. As I've been thinking about this dilemma a lot, uh, I do think I'm going to actually make some changes in 2024. I'm not going to say what that is going to be just yet, but the objective of that is going to actually be keeping everybody happy with like keeping me happy so that I can keep making different types of content, but keeping the folks who are very focused on just wanting farm videos happy as well. And for the folks who want both, it'll be an option for you as well. And so I'm, I'm working on a plan for that, but that'll, that'll be some changes that you start to see in January. Has there ever been a sponsor that has contacted you that you had to decline there for moral reasons? Oh, I decline on sponsors all the time, like a lot. I, I, I genuinely try to only do a couple of sponsored videos a month because number one, I don't want to just become oversaturated with, with it. And number two, I really want to believe in the products and services that I'm offering. And I decline stuff all the time. And uh, yeah, I don't want to name names because I don't want to get in trouble. But but yeah, most definitely decline. What does it mean for you as a YouTuber when somebody dislikes your video? I mean, like I hinted at earlier, it, it can be disappointing sometimes when people dislike your videos. Not that like it's disappointing or really hurts me when somebody hits like the dislike button on a video. That, I don't get, care about that. When I get people like writing me long emails saying how my videos are turning terrible or they really hate this one video I made about this topic that they don't agree with. Yeah, it's a bummer. Maybe that's not how I should feel, but that is how I feel. Have you lost any love for your farm or creating videos since you started? Do the videos feel like work sometimes? No, I haven't lost any love for the farm whatsoever. I, I, I love farm life. I love getting out there and doing the chores each morning. I love documenting a lot of it. I love telling the stories of the different animals on our farm. I, I love doing all of that. Sometimes I like to do other things as well as that. And that's, that's part of the distinction. I think one of the reasons why I'm actually pretty good at making videos about the farm is because I didn't grow up on a farm and I just have a lot of wonder and fascination and love to bring to life like all the things that I'm seeing on the farm and I try to do that in the videos. And so I think that that's actually one of the things that, that makes me good. As I get more experience as a farmer and as I do this for year over year over year, how do I continue to maintain that sense of wonder and excitement and joy so that I can try to capture and document that and share that with all of you guys? How do I keep that alive? I think that that's actually something I'm continuing to work on and find ways to do. How much do you make from your YouTube content? You know, when I put the call out for questions, this by far was the most frequently asked question I got. And over the years, yes, I've always disclosed how much money I made from actual farming operations, and I never talk about how much money I make from social media or content. And as I've said before, it really comes down to a couple of factors. Number one, and probably the most important thing, I, I think it actually puts me and my farm at a disadvantage when I share that. Like if I'm sharing those numbers when I'm negotiating with sponsors or negotiating with various platforms or other partners, you ultimately self-sabotage by having so much transparent data out there for them to use in negotiations. And so it doesn't make sense just from that perspective alone. And then the other thing that comes up is like, you know, nobody else has to disclose that. Why do I have to? I mean, just because I'm transparent on one part doesn't mean I can't have a boundary on another. So if it was completely normalized where every single content creator was sharing exactly how much money they would make, I, I probably would be open to sharing it. But since it would only be me, I don't know, that doesn't seem exactly fair. And then I've said it before and I will say it again, I make significantly more from making videos or selling books than I do from actual farming operations. And, and I don't ever try to sugarcoat that or not say that that's the case. And so yes, when I make my how much money did my farm make video later this year, I know this is gonna be something that people get mad about, but let me just set your expectations right now. I'm still not gonna share those numbers. Like. Full stop. Are you running out of ideas? Well, this is the third time I'm making a video like this, so this question asker might have a point. 